Hi, students of Sioux North. Um, I'm glad that you're joining in today. Uh, we're happy to be able to connect today to Louis Sirota, who is an architect, and his specialty of design is educational buildings and schools. And it's kind of interesting that Lewis is connecting to you and you are not in it right now, but in one of the newest schools in Ontario and probably one of the most beautiful learning spaces imaginable. So I'm, I'm going to ask a few questions that um, your teacher sent to me to ask on your behalf. And Lewis is going to do his best to answer them. And then at the end, he's going to share some of examples of his work in, um, in building schools and design, designing schools, not building schools. So Lewis, um, you're an architect. What type of uh, schooling did you need to have to complete? Was it college, trade school? Um, and what kind of courses did you need in high school in order to um, move forward with being an architect? A great question. And first off, glad to be here today. And i um, glad that any students are listening to this and considering a career in the field of architecture. Um, so to start off with high school, at least, um, I was initially very interested in art classes. So ceramics, drawing, painting, and then I saw that there was a drafting class. So I took that and in that class kind of just used the software of the industry to make floor plans. And I'd say about half the class didn't like it. The other half really liked it. And I was one of those folks. <laughs> so then um, there was a career section at the end of that class and they kind of shared with us that we could just become a drafter. So if you wanted to only work in that program and draft up floor plans, that's drawing with little lines in the computer basically. Um, you could go to a two year trade school and start to do that. So there are a lot of opportunities out there and you would essentially work for an architecture firm or a contractor and they would have you do adjustments in that computer program. Your title would be something like drafter. But if you wanted to go a little further with it, then you might consider going to a university um, where you would study architecture. So you'd start with a undergrad and you could really do that in a lot of places all over the USA and Canada. Um, and that's kind of a four year program. It starts out with general ed classes and then gets a little more specific where you actually are um, designing buildings. And it's really, really fun. I'd say that most of my college experience was very hands-on. So I was always making stuff, always had cool stuff to do and show my friends. Um, I really, really liked it because of that art background I, I had. Um, it was a really good fit for me. There are other colleges though that are, go the technical route. So it would be a lot more math and um, like the technical nature of architecture. But either way you would go, the art way or the technical way, you'd really end up at the point where you have your undergraduate degree <clears throat> and you could go then work at an architecture firm or a developer or a contractor or a lot of other places that are hiring people to do design work at this point. So you're kind of moved out of that drafting and into the more design world. Um, but that's still not 100% complete. But um, I'll pause there for a second and say that if you do not want to go further in your education and get a master's degree, and you just wanted to exit and get some real world, world experience, a lot of people do that. Um, they're, they're looking to kind of see whether this was the right path before committing another few years for a master's degree. And then they go back to school for their master's degree. Or you could just get it all done at once. <laughs> so that's what I did. I, I stayed in school and I got my master's degree. And then when I graduated, um, kind of got the comprehensive education that an architect would get. Um, and the reason you might do that is if you have your master's degree, then you can get licensed. And if you are licensed, you can own your own company and work for yourself. And that's very similar to what I do is I have my license, I work for myself and 
um, I can get the kind of projects I want. Um, I don't really have to answer to too many people. Um, and it's very nice, but I couldn't have gotten that unless I had, um, went to school and got the undergraduate, the graduate, and then the license. So it was a long path, but I would say it was well worth it. And how long did that path take for you? Um, so the undergraduate was four years, um, four to five years is typical. And then master's degree for me was just one year. And there's only like four or five colleges that do that in the US. Um, but more typically, it would be a two year master's degree. So I would say the students could expect anywhere between five, seven years in, in school. And then you could start working and making really good money at that point. Awesome. Uh, when did you first know that architecture was the career for you? <laughs> um, I take that back to, and I'll put that in a way that I think a lot of the students could relate to it because I think that um, me personally, I'm more of the artsy type. So my teachers in high school, I think were really helpful in that, um, pointing me in the right direction. So as we got into like 11th and 12th grade, they teachers started um, helping put you in specialty classes. So they noticed that I was really good at drawing and um, organizing like a painting. So I started to, I really like that, but you have to think like, I can't just paint for a living. <laughs> at least my mom would say that. You can't just paint for a living. Some people do, but that's not maybe what um, would make you the most money. So what careers could you do with that kind of skill? Um, and then I was laid out a bunch of different career paths and I chose the architecture one because I thought I liked math. <laughs> but maybe I don't actually like math. And to my benefit, I think that architecture, because a lot of it's in the computer, it's a lot less math than you would think. Barely any, actually. I think the people that do math are the engineers. So mechanical engineer, structural engineer. Um, but also I wanna, I wanna point out one other thing too, is I think that there's a lot of different people um, out there that have like different kinds of brains. So um, people that have a really technical brain, like thinking about how things might go together, might also be a good architect. So also um, someone that's good with patterns and colors, maybe you really enjoy arranging your room, um, making it look good. You might be a good architect or interior designer even. Um, if you're a really social person too, you just like talking to people, you also could make a good architect because part of what I do is talk to the client and builders and engineers and figure out what they need and kind of put it all together. So um, that I, I'm good at that, but that's not my primary directive. And I have some friends that all they do all day is talk <laughs> and they're also architects. So that might, that might be fun for some people. And lastly too, I think if someone like really enjoys video games, or computers and coding, there's a, a lot of what I do to, is in the computer, in these computer programs that are sometimes very complicated. So I have friends that do nothing but play video games at night, but during the day, they're just so good in that computer program and they help everybody out in the firm trying to figure out how to pretty much build the building within the computer so we can make the documents later. Um, so anybody with those kind of, I'd say, skills or interests might consider um, the path of architecture. That's awesome. So lots of skills and talents and, and gifts can go into becoming an architect. It sounds really exciting. Um, so Lewis, what are you, what are the main responsibilities in your job? So, um, I would say right when you get out of school, your responsibilities will kind of start out small and then grow as you have more and more years um, working in the field. So right away, you might get work from, say, a project manager, um, and they would give you little things to do. So 
they might say, why don't you build this floor plan? Um, here are the rooms, here are the sizes. And then after you kind of build that, they would then, the project manager would then critique what you're doing and they'd say, oh, you need an extra door here, you need a window here, um, give you more help so that it's actually buildable. So right at the beginning, you're doing a lot of that hands-on learning and figuring out what things you did wrong by doing it. And then as you fix them, you less make fewer and fewer mistakes until I'd say you've been in the field for two to three years, and then you actually become that project manager type person. And you're actually then talking to the client and engineers a little more, and you're doing some of the work, but you're also then telling other people that are right out of school those same things that you had just learned. Um, so it's, I would say, the responsibilities kind of vary um, for the first 10 years under those two kind of categories. And then after that, you can start to use your experience to get work and be in the field a little more. And that's kind of the point where I'm at. So I'm traveling to different schools, meeting with the teachers, principals, people that are paying for it, the people that are building it, really figuring out what they want, and then coming back home and figuring out how that might look. So I'm coming up with the list of rooms and the sizes, and then I'm working with the project managers to figure out how to put it all together. And then I'm looking over the completed work and making sure that it really matches what the client wanted. And also, because our firm specializes in very innovative schools, I'm also working with teachers that work for us um, that are making sure that the spaces work together well. Are they innovative? Can the teachers co-teach? Are multidisciplinary, flexible? All that stuff that maybe normal architects wouldn't do, I'm starting to do. And that's personally why I really like my job is that little extra step in there um, that I get to do things that not many architects <laughs> get to do. And I, I think that you're seeing that in your school too is why is it so awesome there? Well, it's because we put a little extra love into the design of it, I'd say. Yeah. And, and the teachers and the community had a lot of input into what was built in that school with a lot of intent and it really truly is a special place. Um, what does a typical workday look like for you? <laughs> well, right now I work from home, so it's really awesome. So I have two dogs here. So feed them, have my morning coffee, read some articles about architecture, kind of get primed for the day. And then I start to answer emails for a few hours. Then I do some creative stuff. And then I go for a run, then I get back in the afternoon and I either answer emails or do more creative stuff. But that's not very typical. Not many architects work from home. So um, I'll also describe some of my experience when I did work in an office. Um, pretty much you get there in the morning, you talk to your friends and colleagues, if there's engineers in there too, people normally wander around and chit chat for 30 minutes to an hour, mainly talking about personal stuff or projects even. And normally there's a morning meeting, kind of like a brief to go over the work you're gonna do in the day or the week. Um, then you get to work and all throughout the day, you're kind of having little problems that you're needing to solve. And it's really nice because everyone around you is having problems. and they're always asking people and talking to each other about how to solve them. So if I couldn't figure something out, I go walk over and ask somebody. And if they don't know, they probably know somebody I could go ask. So, and then I, then I get back to my desk and I solve that problem. Um, <laughs> and sometimes you don't have somebody in the office that can solve that problem. So you need to ask someone else over email or give them a call and then wait for a few days before you can solve it. So I think that you need to be really, um, really organized and self-driven to kind of 
figure all this stuff out. <laughs> I'll give you an example of the, a problem. So um, the engineer wants to put these really big mechanical units in the building, but you don't have any space for them. And then he also wants to them to be hooked up and there to be two of them. And you've never dealt with this before. So you're wondering kind of how to design the space. What would it look like? So I would need to go ask somebody that I thought might have done that in the past. So you need to be able to collaborate and communicate with um, your colleagues to solve those problems, right? <clears throat> Absolutely. So that's a really important skill I hear in architecture. Yeah, and you know, it's kind of like a team setting too. What I'm describing is um, you're always, um, you're always asking for help and people are glad to help you. So I kind of feel like part of a family even, and it's really nice. Um, and also no days the same too. It's not like I'm going into work and doing the same thing every day. It's always a little different and that's kind of nice. You know that it takes about six to eight months to design a building. So, and each step of the process is a little different than the previous. So um, even after that eight months finishing designing a building and you start over again, it's kind of nice. So you're doing gradually different stuff throughout it. And then you start over with a new project. You are doing the same kind of stuff, but it's seemingly different because eight months have passed new client, new building. Um, I really like that. That sounds exciting. And you can tell that you really love what you do because you're smiling as you're talking about it. So that's great. Um, so what do you like most about your job? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> I, I really like seeing the end product um, and the fact that things I see in the, in the world that I enjoy. Um, Say I like boats and water. Um, I could actually bring that as a metaphor into the design of the building. So maybe I make um, the bottom of it really straight and sleek like the water and then the top is kind of more um, flowing and I don't know a word for that symbol. <laughs> but then that becomes the basis of the design of the building and it's kind of all based on boats and interests that I have, but the building might look like that or maybe not, but in the process, I kind of had fun thinking about that metaphor, as we call it, into the design of the building. And that might be just for me, or it might be for the client. Maybe someone else likes something like, I don't know, flowers and meadows. And then it's my job to kind of translate that into something and explain to them, why I think that I did that. So I, I really like that kind of, it's like a conceptual puzzle and <laughs> it's fun every time. Which is awesome. Yeah, and it, like, I, I would love, like to look at buildings in a different way after you've described that. So maybe the students can look at some interesting buildings online and maybe think about what the architect was thinking in the back of his head when he designed that building. Um, so that's really, that's really cool. Um, and what's your biggest challenge at work? Um, I would say that it's waiting for advice and input. Um, is where you go through all the school and do that work, but often, somebody needs a little bit of time to review what you've done or maybe get back to you. And sometimes you, you're really eager to solve that problem or to finish something, but you need to sit and wait for somebody to look at it and review it. And um, ideally that would take like a few days, no big deal. But like right now, what we're dealing with is we're waiting a month or so for input on our work. So I have to kind of set that, passion and interest down and then move to something else and i found that that's a little hard to do yeah it must be when you just want to keep the process moving um and what advice would you have for someone who would want to start out in a career in architecture 
Um, wow. Well, first off, I would say that there is so many different paths in architecture. So it's kind of very low risk because if you start to not like it, you could easily pivot and do something else. So you could, with the type of skill set that you're getting in that undergraduate degree or technical degree, or even if you go start working and you don't like it, um, you could pivot and you could do something like landscape architecture. It's very similar, but you're doing a lot more working outside. Right. You could even be the contractor that does that work. But since you have the background and you're kind of understanding how it's designed, um, you, you have a really good basis to be even better at that job. Um, interior design site supervisor you know you don't like the design part you could be the person that builds it and that's not even just the person putting the hammer to the nail it's the person on the job site reading the architecture plans and telling the people what to do it's called a site supervisor there's even the person that places the order for all the building materials so they read the plans and quantify the amount and then they place the order you could cost estimate and estimate stuff once again, reading those plans and um, building it. You could sell the building products. You could be a salesperson. Um, you could teach architecture. Um, you could survey existing buildings. Um, some people are very introverted and don't like being around people. And I think there's a lot of jobs in our industry too for those type of people is you're out on your own maybe four, four out of five days a week. And then you're really only around people one of the days. And I think a lot of that's um, surveying and types of building, <clears throat> types of construction. Historic preservation or even government work too is um, every time I'm building a building, we have to give the plans to the city and then architects that work for the city look over those plans. So all of that kind of summarizes, my advice is um, don't give up. And if you go into this field, and you're kind of feeling like it's not for you, don't be afraid to look at the wide array of different used um, it kind of building your career. It's okay to pivot. That's good. And that's being flexible and using your gifts where they, where they land. Um, so Lewis, can you share um, some of your sample work? Like what, so the students can see what you have created? Sure, of course. Um, yeah, let me share my screen right now. Okay, can you see this PDF? Yep, oh wow. Okay. <clears throat> so what I'm gonna share is a project that I worked on and it's kind of a very unique project, but I really, really enjoyed this project because the client was so, so good. So it is a university actually, and a developer, so that's someone with a lot of money that wants to build something, um, was looking to put a school in their big development. So it had houses, businesses, movie theaters, restaurants, they also wanted a school. So they were looking for school architects and they found us. And then they said, well, what do we do? <laughs> so we kind of helped them from the very beginning of the process and we helped them find somebody that would help kind of start up the school. And that person then found Texas Tech University was looking to open a satellite campus. So what the developer and this person did was figure out that rather than having just a brand new school in this area, they would have a satellite college there for Texas Tech University. So um, Costa Rican, this project was in Costa Rica, which made it even more fun because I got to go there. <laughs> and um, I had a few days to have some fun, so I got to see the beaches and stuff. But I, I would say that was just inspiration. <laughs> um, so they figured that if they had a campus there, 
Texas Tech students from Texas could go down and visit and do a semester abroad, but also they could have Costa Rican national students get high quality American education right in their backyard. And probably 70% of the students at this school are Costa Rican students. Um, and they give it, give the education them at a very good Costa Rican dollar rate, which is far different than the United States rate. And I personally really appreciate that they're doing that because a lot of the time, just because of the exchange rate, students from Costa Rica can't afford to go to an American university. Um, but this program and this building allows them to get that, which I think is just fantastic. And I was glad to be a part of it. So right from the beginning, because the developer was looking for us to put a lot of the input, we got to figure out exactly what the building was gonna be, what it's gonna look like, what are the spaces gonna be in there. And that was a huge challenge because we didn't essentially have a client, so we had to guess what they might want. So we started with learning cycles. So in any good day, how do you learn? Well, you learn in an active way, collaborative way, individual way. And any really good day that you're learning kind of has a little bit of each of these. And if you spend too much collaborative time, you might not get a lot of work done because you needed that individual time to really get the work done but also active time too. If you're just sitting all day, kind of gets to be too much. So actually hands-on learning is really good too. So we wanted to put all three of these things into the design of the building. And also we wanted the building to be flexible too, as we didn't want it to be just about lectures. And I think this is a little bit how your building is designed too, is you can, you can have lectures, but also the teachers can work together. So that principle and many others, we wanted to put into the core DNA of the building so that it was really agile for the people using it. And in this project, we didn't know who was gonna be using it, so it needed to be flexible. So no matter who ended up there, they'd be able to kind of adapt the space to be able to use it. Um, so we were thinking Costa Rica is a great location to have a satellite university because it's kind of in the center of the world. If you look at it that way, you could really say anywhere is in the center of the world, but um, it's a really good location for Central America and South America. Um, also, the place that they had a site designated where they wanted the building was in the middle of Costa Rica. And it's a really close drive to a lot of their the best scenery in the country. So it's good for the students visiting there to be able to get out and see places. So that was a real draw for Texas Tech. Um, that community development that the project would be in, it has live, work, play, and now we're adding learn. So it kind of becomes a self-sufficient ecosystem is you could just stay there all day and you'd never be bored, which I think was good, good for university students too. Sometimes they don't leave campus. So the more stuff that was there for them is the better. Uh, so this was the site we were given. Um, it's right here. It's part of this development as I was just describing. So we had to take this little chunk of land and figure out exactly what to do. So back up a bit here. So we did start with a schedule, figured out how long is it going to take to design it? How long is it going to take to build it? And then how many, um, <clears throat> how many students? And also we were looking at how many students in classrooms versus common spaces versus lab spaces. And these kind of more numbers and less diagrams kind of helped us decide exactly how much of each space type we we're going to put into the building. And also, because the space was so tight that we had to deal with, we needed to figure out how many levels was it going to be. So we needed seven levels to fit everything we thought we needed. <clears throat> this is a section cut diagram. So a lot of what I do is make diagrams like this so that we can explain our ideas to people that really wouldn't understand 
more of these graphs and charts. So um, we also needed parking, so we started there. And um, we also were thinking a lot about future expansion of the building. So we had levels just left empty so that really the school could grow into these areas in the future. Um, and the start of what we were doing was bubble diagrams. It's very simple. Where would everything go? And then we built up to floor plans. So notice how these kind of bubble diagrams translated into floor plans. This took about a month and a lot of back and forth with the client. And then we added furniture to that. <laughs> so you could really then at this point start to see how they might use the classroom spaces opposed to the flexible spaces. And with these movable walls, how they might join things together. And I mentioned earlier drafting. Um, this was done by one of our drafters. So they put everything in 3D so that we could see the furniture, the spaces, and the walls. And I think that out of everything I've shown so far, this was really the only diagram that the client and teachers really responded to. So I did a, we did a lot of work. Um, and then this just small part of it was well received by them. So um, sometimes you got to know that too, is what exactly is the client going to respond to. So maybe if I had known that, we would have showed a lot more of these diagrams to them. And then this was the exterior of the building. I talked a lot about floor plans too, as um, I think that with a school, the way it functions is very critical, but it also needs to be beautiful too, like in my metaphor example. So um, this design of this building was meant to kind of look out over that community. So this whole wall is windows and it's covered by a screen because it's really sunny there. And that overlooks the whole development behind it, which was really, really nice. And my favorite part of the building was up here. Um, and it was kind of their gym. And it was outdoors and it really had a good view and you could even see bits of the rainforest from there. And the client, client loved it, but unfortunately um, they sold this plot of land and at that point, they asked us to do this design of the building because they loved it on another plot of land that was a different shape. So we had to set aside all of our work <laughs> and um, design a completely different building. And I'm jumping way to the end. So after we went through that entire process again, um, we ended up with the Texas Tech University building. And this is the actual building, the built space. It's very much like the initial design that we did in concept. It just looks a bit different. There it is. And things changed so much in this building. Um, so they only took four levels of the building and the other levels of the building they created offices in. So this is becoming more of a mixed use project now. So the building's not just the school. And also at the front of it, they have restaurants. So it really became more integrated into the community than I ever would have expected. And that, so, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say that must make you, give you such a sense of satisfaction and make you so proud to see an idea that you had come to be such a beautiful building in just a magical space. Oh, well, thank you. It was, it was fun. And um, best part about being an architect, I think too, secondly, is the fact that I have so many of these examples to share and I'm very proud of each one. And I remember the process, even though it was 10 years ago, I still remember all the details. Um, That's pretty awesome. So Lewis, we just have like one minute left. So I just wanna thank you so much for sharing um, the process and the education required and especially your passion about architecture 
you make me want to uh, go back and revisit some um, you know drawings that I've done in the past you know dream homes and you know maybe the students can think about what if they were able to design a school what would it look like like you know what would you have maybe changed in Sioux North um, what would you like to include or if you were to build your dream um, apartment what would that look like so all of those steps are necessary in creating um, places and spaces for people to work live and play and shop and it's so cool that we were able to learn that from you and and just you have such joy about your um your career and we're just so grateful thank you lewis thank you very much and i i hope that all of you have learned something from oh. my presentation I'm sure they have. Those were their questions. So you answered them so beautifully. So we'll be in touch. And I'm just going to stop recording for just a second.